So, my name's Rob, and if you want to get in touch with me, it's really simple. You go to Google, or Bing, go to Google, and type SQL DBA with a beard. And what you'll find is that my website is called SQLDBAwithabeard.com, but my Twitter handle is SQL DBA with beard. And there's a really good reason for that. Twitter's got a 15 character limit. So when I first changed my handle, I became SQL DBA with a bear. <laughs> which, which I kept because, you know, the DBA, don't beg for access, yeah. default blame, etc. you know. We always say no, having a big bear is quite useful. But anyway, we're going to talk about continuous delivery for modules to the PowerShell gallery. And the reason that I'm up here standing is because I do that stuff. Okay, so once upon a time I was a production SQL DBA and then I got better. No, sorry, then I developed because this world's always changing. And now pretty much I use PowerShell to automate things, I use DevOps to make things go, and I concentrate mainly in the data platform world because that's where my skills and expertise are. But the beauty of being able to use PowerShell is that we can do it for anything. Um, I'm interested in PowerShell, automation, and SQL. It's PaaS. Oh, falls flat every time, that joke. It's terrible. Um, I speak in two worlds. I speak in the PowerShell community world, and I speak in the SQL, the data platform world. And I help to organize events in both of those worlds. <laughs> And I'm involved in open source projects. And because I do all of those things and I'm noisy, Microsoft made me an MVP, which is great because it means that I'm an MVP. Right. No, it just means I'm an MVP. It's, it's, it's cool. So today's to-do list. Get up, drink coffee, although apparently some people um, have some other requirements in the morning first thing. I, I don't understand this, but I've been told off, you know, we have to be accepting of other people in the world, the ones that like to drink tea in the morning. Learn loads today. Learn loads today at Polacom. Take away all of this knowledge you're gonna take and make your world a better place, make your work a better place. And create a continuous delivery process for delivering modules to the PowerShell gallery. <clears throat> so, why as IT pros should we concentrate on continuous delivery of PowerShell. PowerShell is the glue that will hold everything that you interact with together. It's gonna to enable you to do continuous delivery, to develop things, to create things, to build things. So what I'm gonna show you is something that's gonna enable you to put that into good source control and enable delivery of it nice and easily. Because as we said yesterday, if you are writing code, you're a developer. Right? If you're writing PowerShell, if you're writing YAML files, if you're writing T-SQL, then you're a developer if you're creating things. So let's learn how to do this. DevOps. Looks a bit like this. Do, 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 do. Should have pre-programmed this, shouldn't I? Anyway, here we go, here's, here's our new thing that we're gonna have, and poof, there we go, we're ready. We haven't gone to a factory, we haven't spent a lot of time handcrafting and building stuff, we've pressed a button and poof, the car has appeared. And what we want to enable is that we press a button and poof, some PowerShell appears. In a module, ready. So we need to be able to do this. We need a thing called Plaster. I'm not even gonna talk much about it other than say, go and read some blogs. Plaster will enable you to create a template for your PowerShell module. The one I've got in my GitHub will also include a lot of unit tests for the script analyzer like you learned with Jeff yesterday and for making sure you have good help, just pre-built in. We're gonna need Pester. Pester is amazing. Pester is the first open source 
thing that was embedded into the Windows operating system. It's absolutely brilliant that that came along. However, it's an absolute pain in the neck because PESTA was the first open source thing that was put into the Windows operating system. And the reason for that is Microsoft signed it with the Windows operating system certificate, which is brilliant. And when you come to update it or to install it, you're going to get some errors. Because surprisingly, they wouldn't let that certificate go to some open source people out in the wide world. So the best thing for you to do, because you're IT pros and you probably get admin on your machine, is to take control, take ownership of the PESTA folder in Program Files Windows PowerShell modules. Take ownership of it, delete it. And then run install module PESTA. If you Google, you will see that it says, use skip publisher check. I don't want to advise you to do that. I do not think that you should be going around the security that's built in for installing modules. So do it this way. This is the better way to do it. Then we need a GitHub account. Or we could use the repository in Azure DevOps, which we'll come to in a minute, and an Azure DevOps account. Free, 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 free. None of this is costing you money, but it's going to enable you to work more efficiently and much better. Obviously, there's a lot there. I have exactly 60 minutes, so I have less than 60 minutes left. So we're not going to be able to go into lots of detail into all of this. But hopefully it will give you an idea of what the process can be and how you can make this work for yourself. So PowerShell. We all write PowerShell scripts. We've got .ps1 files. We write a good script. Matty says, oh, that's a great script. Can I have it? Oh, yeah, sure. I'll we'll copy and pack it over there. Then Rick says, oh, that's a brilliant script. Can I have a look at it? Yeah, yeah, sure. Give it to Rick. Then Rick goes, oh, you've got a mistake there. So he fixes it. So now I have to take the copy from Rick and go, Matty, Matty, you know that script here, yeah, use this one. And I give that one to Matty. And then he forgets which one he's supposed to be using because he copied it to a different place. And then he's got the one that doesn't work. And let's stop doing that. Let's create ourselves proper PowerShell modules. It's really simple and easy to do. <coughs> because once you write some functionality, you're probably going to want to use it in another place. Once you've written a script to create something, now let's call it a function. Once you've written a function to create something, you're not going to use it once. We're IT pros. We know the rules, the golden rule. If you're going to do something more than once, automate it. PowerShell is going to enable you to do that. We can share them internally or externally as a module in our own internal repository so all the other team members, all the other IT pros in our organization, or all the people in the community can share the good work that we've done and know that they're getting all of that goodness. And put ourselves in a situation where when Rick finds a problem in the, in the code, he can just commit it to source control and Matty can just pick up the new one. Sad Joey. Sad Joey says, why are you not sharing your module on the PowerShell gallery? I understand that sometimes you might have stuff that's embedded, that's company specific, that you're not allowed to share. In which case, use an internal repository. But if you're writing things that are global, that are available for everybody, share them on the PowerShell gallery. Let anybody make use of the things that you've got. Put the code into a source control, is it GitHub or is it Azure DevOps, so that other people can then help you to improve it and everybody improves. PowerShell Gallery is Microsoft's way of enabling you to share your PowerShell modules and your scripts. It is global, it's available worldwide, and it has some protection in it. So they do make sure that the scripts and modules that are embedded follow certain guidelines and rules 
and are scanned for malware. Does that mean that they're completely safe? Of course it does not. Yeah. Of course it doesn't. If you are downloading things from the internet, as we learned yesterday with Jeff, it is your responsibility to make sure that they're okay for your organization or for your machine. But this is going to be a better way of ensuring that it's safe than just getting it from some OneDrive somewhere. Pester. Pester, as we learned yesterday, is something that enables you to unit test your PowerShell code. Make sure that you have written it in a way that is going to do the things that you expect. I love Pester because I use it in both ways. I use it to make sure that my PowerShell does what it expects. And I also use it to make sure that my environment is as I expect it to be. So we're going to look at an open source module that I'm one of the contributors and founders for called DBA Checks. What DBA Checks does is it makes sure that your SQL, sorry Carl, that your SQL estate is as you expect it. Because anything that you can get with PowerShell, you can test with Pesta. So you all work with technology that you can get information with PowerShell. So you all work with environments that you can test with Pesta. If you're doing it more than once, automate it. Who likes doing documentation? So three people like doing documentation. Yeah? The rest of us know that we have to do documentation because it's important. Pester enables us to document how we expect our code to work. Because we're writing some unit tests for our code, I am expecting that this code will create a storage account. So I can write a test that says, I am expecting this code to, to create a storage account. So when Rick sees the Pester test and he reads through it, he knows that that's one of the things that's expected within that code and that we're testing for. Making some documentation nice and easy. So we're going to use Microsoft's online Visual Studio Online. Oh no, they changed it, didn't they? They called it Visual Studio Team Services. Yeah, that's right. No, then they changed it again and, and now they've called it Azure DevOps. <laughs> The reason I point those things out is because if you go and Google for help with something to do with Azure DevOps, you're not going to find very much because the name changed three weeks ago. So you might want to use VSTS as well. So Azure DevOps comprises of these things. We have boards. Kanban boards, a way of organizing our teams, putting tasks up, making sure things work as possible. If you're working with a JIRA or a TFS or something like that, it's exactly the same. It's a great way of enabling you to organize how your team is working. We've also got test plans. So good places where you can embed all of your testing. Make sure that things work as you expect them to do and uh, you can create some magical purple liquid. I mean, it's a shame. It should be, this should be red and that should be blue and it should end up as purple. Yeah. So why do you have many things? Yeah. Why do you have, why do you have many things in these things? <laughs> Got our repositories. Here we go. This is what a repository looks like. This is our source control. What you have is a man with a fantastic mustache. <laughs> Throwing frisbees to a man with a beard and a very strange haircut, who then passes it to a lady who puts it into a cabinet. See, I was just thinking they were magical donut trees, and I'm totally down with that. Yeah. <laughs> magical, magical donut trees. <laughs> but this is our source control. So this is GitHub, but it's in Azure, so it's the repo. So it's not GitHub, but it is a way of source controlling your code. Why would you use this instead of GitHub? Because it make it private. You can control who can access it. You can do that with GitHub, but it costs you money. And it's free. And it's free. 
artifacts, things that you make that you can enable other people to have access to. So they could be VHDs for creating your virtual machines. You can stick them up there. They could be your PowerShell modules that you create using the process we're going to talk about, put into this artifact and avail make available internally only to the people that you control with your authentication. I'm not going to talk about any of those things because I'm going to talk about pipelines because pipelines have got rockets. Rockets are amazing. Yeah? Our pipeline enables us to build and to test and to deploy or to release the thing that we create. Free, free, free. Look, all of the frees. Ten free, one free, one free. It's amazing. Now, in some places, you're going to have to pay for using more things. Your organization is going to go above the limit of wanting ten parallel jobs or up to 1,800 minutes. You're going to go over those things. You're going to end up paying for what you use, which is fine because this is your. You're used to paying with what you use. But... If you can write something that's going to be useful for many people and you're going to open source it, this is going to enable you to put that into a nice professional, I don't know what the word is, <laughs> professional thing and enable you to show off your skills. Because you're not necessarily going to be working for the same organization in two years' time. And if you can go, here, look at my open source project. Look at how we build it. Look at the fact you can, we use continuous delivery. And we build and we test and then we deploy in different ways. It's going to add to your skills and make you more useful. So, what we're going to do is we're going to have a PowerShell module that needs to do some things. And we're going to update it. We're going to add some value to it for some reason. And once we've done that, we're going to update our module number because the PowerShell gallery needs you to have an ever-increasing module number. Your identity key, if you like. It needs to be able to differentiate between the versions that you put up. What you could do is go into that file and edit it and add one and then save it. But if you're doing it more than once, automate it. So put that into your process. We're going to sign our code with a certificate. So you know that when you download that code from the PowerShell gallery, it is exactly the code that has been uploaded from GitHub. It does not mean that when Rick gets onto your machine that has that module and alters it to do something malicious, that the code, the certificate's going to go, oh, this is different. It's only at the point of download, because that's the only point where we can go, for sure, what's there is what's expected. And then we're going to publish it to the gallery. Publishing to the gallery is really easy. It's one PowerShell command. But if you're going to do it more than once, automate it. Come on, it's funny. I know it's early, but come on. It's good. It's good. Da, da, da. Don't be scared. Um, escape. Thank you very much. <coughs> this is what the PowerShell gallery looks like. We can search the top for what we've got. This is our DBHX 1.1.155. You see the release notes, the dependencies, all everything we've got. And it's an open source GitHub module. So the beauty of that is that other people can come in and they can write some issues. They say things like, oh, if we look 
Some bloke with a beard, beard says, uh, we need a check for ad hoc uh, distributed queries. And we need a check for cross database chaining. We need those things added. So we can have a look in here. See what we've got. Yep, we need a check. What would you like to check? I'd like to check this value, please. Um, how should it be configurable, true or false? Excellent. So now anybody, I mean, it happens to be me, but anybody can then go to Visual Studio Code because that's what you use to develop your PowerShell scripts. And we can write some new code. So we're going to write a check for is ad hoc distributed queries enabled. We're going to add some unit tests for this. We add a test for is CLR enabled. And we're going to reference the issue number that we've got. So we're going to link all this stuff together. And then We're going to run our tests. Yeah, smiling and enjoy. We're going to run our tests. We're going to check that all of these things are as they're expected. And the reason that we're going to do that is so that I can have confidence that the code that has just been written is not going to break anything. So we saw yesterday with Jeff how we've got some means of going through the AST, passing our code and making sure it's working as we expect it. We're going to check all of the code and the titles within each of these files and make sure that everything is as we expect it. Now you're only seeing the summary of the tests here. We're not seeing every single test that's running. But once we get to the end, green is good, red is bad. 1,571 tests have run in 47 seconds. I'm pretty happy as a developer that everything is as I expect it to be. So let's go a bit nerdy for a minute. Let's have a look and see what we've tested. So perhaps for the checks that we're doing on our instance, we're looking at a, what do we have? Cross database ownership chaining. We've got a test here. And it says mock connect DBA instance, open close curly braces. And what that's saying is, hey, Pesta, when you run this test, every time that you find connect DBA instance, don't go to the DBA tools module and load that code and run the connect DBA instance against the SQL instance. Just return nothing. Because this test is only about testing my code is doing what I expect it. It is not testing that Connect DBA instance works, that the instance is there, that it's available. All we're testing is that we do what we expect. So we're going to create some test cases. And the test case says when the config is one and the expected is false and the actual is true, we're going to check that it fails correctly. So if the actual value that I go and get is false, but I'm expecting true, please pass my test. And if the actual value is true, but I'm expecting false, please fail my test. And then we're going to say, make sure it passes our check correctly. So if we're expecting true and we get true, does, do we get a passing test? And then we're also going to make sure that we actually call the thing that we've mocked. So as well as connect DBA instance, we're going to mock the DBA tools command get DBA SP configure, which goes to our SQL instance, gets all of our configuration items. We'll make sure that as we run that through our unit test, that it has been called exactly four times. And I know that my unit test has run correctly. We're going to pass our test. We're going to have our pokey thing. Oh, 
Let's go for that one, because Mike likes this one. So passes are checked correctly for a config with an expected value. We're going to pass in our config and our expected. So this time we're going to mock our SP configure and say that our configured value equals our SP configure variable. So when we loop through and we say we're expecting true or expecting false, this is what we're going to put in here. And then I'm going to say, right, assert cross DBA ownership chaining. So call the function that's doing this thing and put in a dummy SQL instance, pass in the value that's expected. And unlike most tester, that's all we need to run. Because by default, it expects a response of true. So I get a response of true, I know that I have passed my test. If we're failing our test, we're checking that we're going to fail our test. Whee, come over there, there we go. We're going to mock our SP configure in the same way. We're going to call our function. And this time we're going to put it in curly braces. And we're going to say, here is our pipe. And this is going to show us our actual pest to test. And this time I'm going to say, I should throw this test, this code should fail with an error message. And I expect to get this particular error message. So this is all about DBA checks. And you're all IT pros who don't care about SQL Server. But you know now that you can use DBA tools and DBA checks if you want to interact with SQL with PowerShell, and you should. When you're writing your PowerShell, you know that you can mock the things that are happening inside your code so that you don't actually go and interact with the technology that you're writing the code for. And that you can write a test that is going to expect to get a certain value. Because within PESTA you can say should be X. Should create a storage account called this. Should have five VMs of this size. Whatever it is that you're expecting. If you can get it with PowerShell, you can test it with PESTA. But then we have some other tests. So because my DBA checks open source module uses Power BI to display the results, and we need to make sure that we have all of this formatted in a certain way, I need to make sure that each, each DBA checked PESTA test is correctly formatted for the Power BI and coded correctly. I need to make sure that there's a description for every one of my checks, that every config that I've got should exist. Now all of this feels like it's a lot of work, and it is. But it is about saving time for yourself in the future. If I'm writing some code which takes some configuration items, I need to make sure those configuration items are correctly matched. What we would do in the, in the past is write the code, get some red text, oh, right, crikey, what's the error message? Right, I'll go and fix it. How much easier if Rick writes some code for the module, he runs the, the test, he gets some red, and it points out that there isn't a description for that particular check, Oh, he can just go, fix his code, run the test, the test will pass. He knows what's going on. I'm documenting what I'm expecting to get from this piece of code. The way that we're doing it is by counting how many tags we've got and making sure that there's only one unique one. That's an easy one. If we're checking our context, here we go, we're diving into the AST. We're passing the code that we're writing. 
We're making sure that what we've got inside there is what we expect to get. If you want to go and look at all of this code, it's all available on GitHub. If you want to go and read about it, then you can search for AST. Some bloke with a beard's written a bit about it, but there's other places as well. You can quickly do what we all do, which is work out how's that working and how can I make it work for myself? And write your own pest test and start saving yourself some time. But I said we already had some built-in tests. So one of those is making sure that we have some good help. We need to have help for our PowerShell commands because otherwise, this is what happens. Mike downloads my module, he doesn't know how to use it. He phones me up, he says, Rob, I got red text when I run invoke DBC check. And I say, Mike, did you run get help? Mike says, no. And maybe I might say, Mike, perhaps you should try running get help before you phone me, and then put the phone there. But the point is, don't write code and become the first line support for your code. Make the first line for your support for your code embedded into your PowerShell by writing good help. And this built-in check that you can just go and download will make sure that you have a description, example code, you've got example help, that you've got parameter help for all of your parameters. Everything is as you expect it. And you can also write or make use of the script analyzer that you saw yesterday. So you can go through all of those rules, put those in as pester tests, and make sure that all of those good practice rules are followed as well. So there's two really simple ways of making sure you're writing good professional PowerShell without doing any work at all, because somebody else has done it for you. So, we have some changes that we've got committed down at the bottom here. And what we're going to do now is we're going to make some changes to the development branch of DBHX. So we're just going to sync those changes that we've got good commit messages for, and they're going to fly up to our Azure DevOps, uh, sorry, to our GitHub. And there we go, so they've gone to GitHub. So if we go and have a look here, look at our code, we're in the development branch. We go, we can see we've got the release notes of the ad hoc distributed queries and we've linked it to our issue. So our code has gone into source control. Ping. And because our code has gone into source control, our blue build is going. So we've already got a build running. Haven't done anything. Didn't press any buttons. I just committed some code that I made. Up went my code to source control. Off went my build. What's my build doing? It kicks off the development unit testing code. So this is where I make sure that when Rick writes new code for my module, he doesn't break anything. And we use a hosted um, agent. So I don't need any infrastructure. <coughs> I can just make use of everything that's embedded within Azure DevOps in my build pipeline. Because DBHX needs us to have some extra modules installed, we need to do that because they're not automatically there. Here's the trick with that. What you need to make sure that you do is use the scope current user when you install the module within here and use the force parameter. So the scope current user means that it's only installed within your user directory and only available to you on the machine. And because I don't have control of this hosted agent, I'm not an admin on it, I have to do that. And the force says, don't ask me if I really want it. Just install it, please, because I know that I really want it. 
and I don't want to have to interact with this. I want it to just run. Then we've got something that says run pester. Excellent. Go and run my unit tests. And here's the thing that we do here. We run some tests using invoke pester and we output them to a file called test pester XML of a type n unit XML and we pass through because that makes sure that we get the results of our test into this variable test results. And then I say if the test results fail count is greater than zero, throw an error. Because if Rick writes code that makes the pester test fail, I want the build to stop at that point. I am not using the amazing black marble <laughs> pest to test free <laughs> integration for, for one good, very good reason. As I said, I need to have extra modules installed to be able to um, load DBA checks. And unfortunately, you don't enable me to do that. I've, to I've told Chris. <laughs> um, so we ran our test, we output an XML file of NUnit, and now we use the publish test results task to go and get this XML file and publish the test results. Important thing to remember here. In our control, we need to run this task even if the previous task has failed. So when Rick's written bad code, unless the build was cancelled, because I noticed he wrote bad code and I hit cancel. Always give me the results of my test. I'm going to come back to the documentation in a minute. And you're going to say, well, okay, Rob, it's all very well and good, but how do I do that? Really simple. Click that plus button. Search for something here. This is why you should learn PowerShell. I can run PowerShell on target machines. I can run inline Azure PowerShell. I can just run PowerShell. I can run Azure PowerShell. If you know how to use PowerShell, you don't need to worry about anybody else's tasks. You can just make it all work. Now, there are a lot of other extensions. So if you went and searched for Pester, you'll find the Pester test runner from Black Marble. So you could just add this task. <coughs> In a corporate environment, you're going to need to have certain permissions within your um, repository within your project to be able to add these tasks in. But if you have control of it, you just click add, and <coughs> get it from the extensions gallery, and you can make use of it. Or when you need the publish, publish your code coverage results, publish some build artifacts, publish our test results. So. My build has succeeded. Let's have a look. Has my build succeeded? Do a refresh. <coughs> my build has succeeded. It's gone green. I've got some information. I'm measuring what's going on. When we're doing, when we're doing the DevOps, when we're DevOpsing, we must always make sure that we're measuring what's going on. Yeah. So we're measuring. We can see how long it's taken. We can see which build succeeded and failed. <coughs> the red ones are not so good. We can see what's been released, which versions we're at. We'll have a good look at our test results. This is our summary dashboard. This is free, again, with our DevOps. And it's really simple. We pick a dashboard. We can create a new one if we want to. And we just search for some widgets and add them. Click, drag, drop, change some values, and you have a beautiful dashboard showing you and your team what has been going on. So, we're done editing. Thank you very much. We'll have a look at our build. Test succeeded. 100% passed. Result. Excellent. All is well. I am happy that this code is good enough to go into production. I succeeded. 
I'm associating those tests and that code with these commit messages. So I know what I changed for this particular pipeline. We go and have a look at our tests. We can see that 100% passed and I've got no result. Hooray. Oh, okay. Go to here. Now, warning. Microsoft likes to move where this button goes. There are times when you might be showing this to your colleagues and it was there this morning and it's now over here or it's down the side here or, yeah. It, it's good fun. But if we change this to past, you can see, can't really see much. It's all down there. Let's make it a bit smaller. Yeah. Here we are. We've got some results. This, <laughs> this doesn't work very well with this, <laughs> this um, screen size. But you can see if we look at, click one of these. Let's check that the agent tests Database mail XP passes correctly. Oh, that's only run once. So we've not got any failures. We look at our history. We look at our history. Here is one little problem that you might find. Sometimes Azure doesn't quite work as expected. So things can take a little bit of time to, to come through. Sometimes, it will be unavailable, like it was on Tuesday, for about an hour and a half. And it's only when something is unavailable for about an hour and a half do you realize quite how much you use it. But this test is only run once. If I'd run it more than once, I'd have the history of every time that test had run. There. So, excellent. Completely happy that this test has passed, that this code that I have written is okay. Whatever it is that, that it's going to do, is what I expect it. I can come back to my gallery. I can change to the master branch. This branch is 32 commits behind development. Excellent. I'll do a pull request. Why do we do a pull request? Do a pull request to make sure that we have some review of our code. So Rick, in this scenario, has written some code pushed it into the development branch, we've synced it, we've run all the tests, everything's passed. We're happy that all of that automation has come. We still want to just, that validation, that human being just going, yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm happy. Now, actually, I set it up like this for doing demonstrations because if those tests pass, I'm going to be pretty happy that it could just go straight through. I could automate all of this bit because if you're doing it more than once, automate it. But let's run through the process. We're going to do a pull request. So we need to compare our master branch with our development branch. This is, ah, right, look. Thankfully, the lovely people at DBA Checks have filled this in so we know what we're going to get. So we're going to have a PR and we're going to call this PR Polar Conf Live Demo adding two new tests, sorry, two new checks. Thank you, we love to get PRs. Before we ex ex accept the PR, please confirm that you have zero failing pest tests. I know this because I ran it before I did the push, because I enabled my developers to run the unit tests and make sure it all works. So Rick could have known at his machine everything was fine. Then I double check it with my DevOps build process, but yep, there are no failing tests. What changes do we bring? Added two new, oh, two new checks, you know, never type in demos, always type in demos. We'll create ourselves a pull request. Now all we need is an admin. Anybody know DBA checks admin? Oh, here I am. Excellent. <coughs> cool. So let's have a look. Uh, yep. All of that looks absolutely fine. I've checked that it passed for my development branches. Um, let's uh, merge it. So we'll confirm the merge. So now we've merged our code into master. The changes that we have written in development, that we have tested locally on our machine, that we have then pushed to 
our source control, which has triggered a build and run our unit tests, which have all passed, we're now going to merge that into the master branch. And if we go back to here, our master version is now going to be running. Our build of our master branch is running. And what that's going to do is, load that first, the download my secure file. So within Azure DevOps, I can have things that I need to keep secret. A certificate for signing my code, for example. Yeah. And as well as that, I can have some variables. There's some variables that I can set and some variables that are secret, such as my PowerShell gallery API key for publishing to the gallery and the certificate password for signing my code. I'm gonna do a version change. Remember we said the version needs to be updated by one so the PowerShell gallery can accept, well, not, that version's already there, this is a new version. Add one, automate it, bit of PowerShell. I'm gonna import my certificate from my secure file with the password I've got saved as a variable. <coughs> Copy it into the right place. Sign all of my files with my certificate. So I know, and you know, and your security team know, that the code that's in the master branch in GitHub is the code that is signed by my Azure DevOps master build, is the code that I will publish to the gallery, is the code that you will download. So we have some security over that. We have some warm, fuzzy feeling. And then we publish our artifact. So publishing the artifact means the thing that I built in this state, we're talking about a PowerShell module, PowerShell scripts, could be any sort of thing that we have built, is this one unit so that I know exactly what it is for this version, for these commits, this is the thing that I'm now gonna release. Obviously, I've made some changes to master. I've updated the version in my master branch. And I want that to come back into my development branch. So if you're gonna do it more than once, then you automate it. <coughs> Write a bit of PowerShell, say please can you push this change back to my development branch. Here I need to do a little bit more work. In the logs of this, you will see that it has checked out your source control, but it's checked it out in detached head mode, which means you've got it, <coughs> but you can't push to it. So this is how we make sure that we push to it. We get a PAT token from Git, just an authentication token. We make sure that everything is there um, we make sure we, there we go. We use that pat token at github.com into the head of our development branch and we push our changes. We make sure our changes go all the way through. And whilst we've been yakking doing that, let's see, what have we got? Have we passed? It's beautiful. Oh. <laughs> Don't you just love doing stuff in life? Something's failed. What's failed? Ooh, git failed. Oh, so we can now go into our logs and we can see we failed with exit code 128. Mm. No, I don't know what it means either. So, just go. I was just wondering, because you, you merged before the first the check finished. I wonder if that PR, since the PR closed, while something was still running. You no, know, the, the development build had finished. No, I know, but there was, there was a check that was still running in the PR. Ah, have we got this back again? It might be a very good point. No. So, 
for the sake of argument, you know sometimes you just turn it off and turn it back on again? Let's see what we get. Maybe it's going to work, maybe it's not. But now we can actually watch our build go through and we can see that you can look at all the logs. Now, to be honest, the first time you run this, you're going to watch the logs. The second time you run this, you're going to watch the logs. The third time you run this, you're going to watch the logs, maybe. For the fourth or the fifth time, you might be leaving this running on one screen and doing something else. Once you're happy and used to it, you'll just commit your code. Don't even think about it. Let the tool do its job. Thank you, bright thing. Let's have a look. What have we got? And this time, bingo. We, we succeeded. Normally, I find this fails. If it's going to fail, it fails up here, where we're preparing our job, where we're going and checking out the code. That's normally where I get a failure, and then I just rerun it. This time, we had something slightly different, but it succeeded. Our build has succeeded. Our code is signed. Our artifact has been created. What's our artifact look like? In this scenario, because we can go and have a look at it, it looks like a PowerShell module. <laughs> so it's literally just the parts of the PowerShell code that I want. Now notice, this is not the same as the files that we have over here. That's not going to work. Come down. Thank you. All the way down. So we've got a GitHub code, a VS code, we've got our .git folder are all sat in here. I've excluded those because you don't need to download those when you want to run the PowerShell. If you want those things, get them from GitHub. This is only the things that we actually want to publish to the gallery. So now that our build has succeeded, go away, Red. Have some nice green. Green. Green is good. Master build has succeeded. Now we have some blue over here. This is our release step. So our release step is deploying our build artifact to wherever we want it to be. So in some clients, this will be deploying this particular module to the machine that holds my Octopus deploy agent, or my Azure DevOps agent, or my CI, my Jenkins agent for using within my build and release processes for something else. In other places, it might be going to an internal PowerShell repository so that anybody within the organization can do an install module, name of whatever module we've called, Rick's amazing module. And then they can get all of Rick's amazing module commands available to them on their desktop. And when he updates it, they can just do update module, Rick's amazing module, and they've got the new commands. But our build is going, it's now going to do our release. And our release is floating around here somewhere. Right, let's just click on it. What is our release going to do? Do, do, do. Click. Thank you. What our release is going to do is we only have one environment. We're going to download our artifact, the build thing that we created. So this enables us, if we need to redeploy an artifact from last week, we can go and grab that and release it. We have that control over what we've got. Then we're going to run a PowerShell script. Oh, that's it. What the PowerShell script is going to do is deploy the new code to the PowerShell gallery. And it takes a moment or three to run. So if you remember back here, I said we had some documentation. <coughs> All the other steps that we've seen within our build and release process have been PowerShell inline scripts with the code embedded in. That's one way of doing it. Is it the best way? Maybe not. Because Rick might have really great ideas about how we can release and build our code as well. So if we include our scripts Within our repository, we can use the file. We can go and pick up the script. I can't remember where it is. Let's assume, oh no, I can. It's down here somewhere. 
So we can go and pick up a script. We just pick a script. There it is, build docs. Click on it, and it'll automatically put it in there. What's that script doing? So our build the docs script is going to use read the docs dot com dot co maybe. And that is going to enable me to have all of my good PowerShell help that I wrote. Remember, we said, don't be the first line support for your code. Write good PowerShell help. Now I'm going to be enabling a website with all of the help code on there. But I, again, if you're going to do it once, more than once, automate it. So we're going to take some content from our release markdown document, and we're going to Add it. Oh, let's start at the top. There we go. Um, we take our release and our change documentation, and we're going to add it to this YAML file. Beauty of Visual Studio Code. I can work in PowerShell. I can work in Markdown. I can work in YAML. It's my YAML. I've got a site name. I've got a site author. Where did my documentation go? Got some licensing, and that's it. I run my build docs code. It's going to go through, and it's going to pass out my change log, my release log, go through all of my functions, and set some content. Now, as it happens, I've got one here. So this is now going to say, here we go. This is what I want you to build the website with. So I'm going to build the website with some pages, a home, functions. Where is the markdown? Markdown sits in my docs, in my functions, literally just the scraping of my PowerShell help. <coughs> so if the change that Rick has made has also meant that he's needed to write a new example for the help, that he's put that into the PowerShell code, we don't need to think about it. It's all completely automated and free. Follow this. It's created some markdown. And read the docs.org. We go and have a look at DBA checks. And all we do is we point that at our GitHub repository, and we say, when a new thing comes in, go and check that YAML file, and that YAML file will then go and build me my new documentation website. Again, free. You can use this as long as your documentation is something that you can put online on the internet, because obviously it's going to be searchable by Google and all the rest of it. But now we have something fancy like this. I'm no web designer. I couldn't write this. Yeah. We can see, um, what have we got? We've got build status. We see what's happening in our, um, our whole build process. We could go through, we look at our release notes. Oh, we're still there the last lot of release notes that were, okay. We can look at the code, how do we write our code? Examples, parameters, patterns, everything that we need, automatically generated. We don't even need to think about it. So, let's see how far through this we are. Succeeded, bingo. Look at this, green is good, everything's good. Nice, like, come on, really, has it? So we're on version 1.1.155. If we refresh that, it's still going to say the same thing, because it's hard-coded in there. But if we come down here, we've got version 1.1.156. If we come down to our package details, we look at our release notes, you see that that is the code that we've just demoed. That's the release process we've just demoed sat here in this room. Ah, come on, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's a, that's a live, yeah, go on, yeah, we can do that. Thank you. <laughs> Deployed all the way through. 
from a code change. Well, this is really fun. The last time I was in Finland, I, um, I had it translate what I was saying into Finnish at the same time. Apparently, it's really funny to the Finnish people because it's kind of almost right, but not quite. So, continuous delivery of the PowerShell module to the gallery is easy. You've seen how easy it is. I know there was a lot of confusing things in there, but the process is fairly simple. Put your code into source control, write good unit tests, create a build process that's going to run those unit tests, and a release process that's going to push them to wherever you need them to be. If you're automating these things, if you're doing these things more than once, then automate them. So automate these things. Plaster is what you need to be able to create your module template. Pester is what you need to be able to test your PowerShell code. Azure DevOps is fun and free, so there's no reason why you can't get on and use it. If you want to see any of this code, search for DBA checks. You'll see all of the code that you've seen, all of the build process is all there. You'll find a link to the release as your DevOps because it's public, so you can even see the logs of what's going on, understand what's happening. If you want to see any of my presentations or get the, this slide deck, if you go to github.com slash SQL DBA with a beard, you'll find a presentations folder. You'll see that it's split up by year and then by um, event name. So hopefully you can find 2018 and PolarConf and you'll find this and anything else that I've done. Okay. No, wait for it. Wait, no, no, wait for it. This is worth it. Are you ready? <laughs> Questions? Oh, we don't know. We're all a bit scared. Bruh. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to go with green. Green is good, so I'm going green first. Yes, so sir. I was thinking about when you were reviewing, you're going through the PR and you said, oh, you know what, all the tests passed, so I could automate this and just auto merge it. Yep. Um, the only thing about that is, like, what do you think about, you know, where, where, where does code review come in in that process? You know, if you're, if you're talking about having somebody look at just because of test pass, where does, does code that mean that that's actually a thing that someone should have done in the first place? Right? So the question is, where does code review come into this process? If I could automate the um, build and test of my development branch, and then I could automate the deployment of the code into my master branch and release, where is the code review? Where is the human in this PR. building? PR. PR. Right. Yeah? OK. Um, that's really cool. And you absolutely can do that. But what about if you write really good tests? If I'm completely confident that my tests are doing what they're expecting to do, because I'm scraping my code, I'm making sure that you're writing your code in the right format, I'm using script analyzer, I'm making sure you're writing good help, I'm making sure that my descriptions and everything is happening, I'm writing my unit tests, which is making sure that everything is working as expected. Perhaps I want to practice on a thing and put another step in, and I would have an integration build where I would actually build the thing that the code was for then I have confidence that it's actually doing what I expect with real life things, then I can just push it through. But I submit but, a PR to you, right? That doesn't mean that just because it passed the test that you as a maintainer want the feature that I actually always put it in There is always human capacity needed to check. Yes. Just because you can <laughs> doesn't mean that you should, yeah? Um, so it's a, it's a really good point. That PR review was not a good PR review. But there again, I wrote the code. I wrote the issues in GitHub, so I knew that everything happened <laughs> as expected. Um, it depends on how you want it to work. It might be that you want to take your PR into the development branch so that you, you say, Rick, write me some new code, or Rick decides to write some new code, and then he puts a PR into the development branch, and then I look at it and I go, no, Rick, I don't really need that, but it's really cool, could you perhaps do this before I accept it into development and then pass it through? Could be that I don't want to do that, I want to wait until Rick's written the code and make sure it passes all the tests that I expect, 
and then do the PR when I'm going into my master branch. Depends how complex your scenario is. I've only got one place for this to go. It just goes straight into the parish or gallery. It, 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 all, it all depends. What, what is your experience of where you would put the PR in that process? So I like to, uh, to put the PRs to master, mm -hmm. like that, so because I like short-lived feature branches. Uh, but I always, I do like human look, even, even if it passes all the tests, because I want to make sure it's okay. And I'm, I'm going to tweet for you a link. Jesse Frizzell wrote a great blog post called The Art of Closing. It's yep. about being an open source maintainer and about how sometimes you have to say no just because everything was right, it, you know, because you're taking on features that yep. maybe you don't want to support. Yep. But. Absolutely. There's a question over here by a man with the hair. Yeah, so, um, so I will ask the question, but actually before I ask that question, I'll, I'll, I'll chip into the conversation a little bit. So um, I think there's a, a scenario um, that I came across in Braxton's help where actually you don't want to do human intervention and their tests are the gatekeeper, which is, and it's relevant, to a multi priorities, they have a single repository of most people that their network security group definitions for Azure. And they have a set of tests that run in the Visual Studio VSTS extension to check for the compliance of the rules. Anybody can put a PR into that repo to include their firewall exceptions. But if it fails the build because it fails the compliance check, then a human being goes, ah, what are you trying to do has a conversation? <coughs> so it's completely awesome. If you pass the test, it goes in. But that's because they've written a set of tests that encompass by what says everything you want. Exactly. Whereas I think with the PowerShell one, you wouldn't. I know, but, but I, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's actually, um, I'm, I'm completely happy with that. Yeah. yeah, so the only thing I might add is have you put in something that's referencing an issue? And if it wasn't referencing an issue, maybe I'd want a human PR. Otherwise, I've, I've written that code so well that if the code you write fails the tests, then I don't want it in. But if it passes the test, you're not going to break anything. And that's, I, I, it's, it's about having that, that confidence within yourself, I think, with, with what you've written for your test. So, but so your question. question is actually completely unrelated to that. So when you, you, when you did your PR, yep. I noticed that GitHub triggered the automated build in VSTS. Yes. Actually, I genuinely wonder what your experience of that was. Um, it, it, it's a good, it's an excellent point. Because um, I didn't, I didn't show that part. Um, so that's my release, there's my build. Look at my triggers. This is where we set up the continuous delivery, the, the, and we um, enable that on build. Oh, I'm in the wrong place. Um, <coughs> uh, confusing, if I'm honest. It's enabling your, it's whether you do it on commit or on pull request, don't do it on both. Because otherwise, I find I had two, I had two sets of builds running. <laughs> Why have I got two sets of builds running? Well, because you've asked me to do two sets of builds. You've asked me to build on commit, and you've asked me to build on pull request. Um, I find that it starts the um, build when the pull request is submitted. I would prefer it if it started the build when the pull request was confirmed accepted rather than when it was committed. So it, it, it's something that I could, I, it, I, I, what I could do is put it back into this conversation and say that actually what I could do is have a pull request into development which sets off the build that runs all of the, the unit tests. Yeah. So, so does GitHub let you do the, if the build fails, the pull request cannot be completed? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in fact, yeah. an interesting thing that happens with GitHub that I've noticed is that, so you can protect you can protect the master branch. But the other thing that's kind of fun that I've seen is if you're on mobile, it will not let you merge a uh, pull request to fail and test in the mobile version of the browser. <laughs> now, of course, if you need to do that, you push the little button at the bottom that says show it to me in desktop. Not that I've ever merged fail and test before, and I like that you need to know how to do that. <laughs> Huh. 
I think I'd seen that one as well. But yeah, it, um, what was I showing you? I was showing you that it, um, that it does actually, that you can actually set it up so that when you get that red X, it doesn't actually merge into, into mass. Any, any more for any more? Or do you all want coffee now? Hands up, who wants coffee now? Excellent. I'll, I'll say goodbye, but you can catch me anytime.